What's up guys, welcome back. I'm Charles, MX Revival, mxrevival.com. First and foremost, you're gonna hear a lot of racket today. It is windier than a bitch outside. I got leaves and dust blowing in on me right now. Today we are getting into episode three of the 2022 RMZ 250 AF build. Man, that is kind of a mouthful. It's been a couple weeks since I've been able to work on my beloved Suzuki project and that is because I have been running like a raped ape on your YZ 250 giveaway build, Project Thundercracker. I will link that in the description below for you guys. I don't wanna take too much time from today's video but if you haven't jumped on board yet you've missed over 25 mx parts giveaways going on in every episode of that build series and of course you want to get entered to win the yz250 build i'll be done with that in about four weeks so you are running out of time so guys today we're going to talk about air boots and which ones you need to run 250 or 125 we're going to talk about radiators which ones you need to run 250 or 450 and then we're going to go ahead and talk about the fuel pump setup and how to possibly delete that fuel pump in the bottom of your tank what what I intend to do to plug that, tap it for a pet cock, so on and so forth, and then some of our next challenges. At any rate, when we left off with our RM250 AF project, I was having a battle with the air boot. Now, using the 250 air boot, no matter what I did, removed a little more metal out of the front of the frame to drop the engine, I couldn't get the air boot high enough there was a massive gap as some of you may remember between the air boot and the air box in episode two well i got to thinking man this is just never ever going to fit there's just no way and then i started looking at more photos and talking to more people and i noticed that nobody's using the 250 air boot at all and so that was a big leg up and a step in the right direction and so what i came to realize at the end of all that was that everybody's running the rm 125 air boot it is quite distinct it has the three diamonds in the side and so this is what we needed all along the air boot here with the grids in the side this is the rm250 air boot and it is no good for this project and so moving forward we're going to go ahead with the rm125 air boot that was a big big deal i'm going to get into some specifics of which rm125 and why in just a minute but as you go along with these projects and you haven't done it before you start to figure things out and so when stuff like this happens i get pumped because every little tweak is one step closer to riding this bad boy so check this out i have an air boot in here right now this is also from an rm125 the minute i realized this was a thing i jumped onto facebook marketplace because this is a part you can order but you don't ever know if it's going to come because they don't make rm125s anymore and so i was worried this was going to be one of those back orders that took months i'll tell you about where i got it in just a second and i'm glad it came actually ended up with two brand new ones that's really good news and so as i was saying when i learned that i needed to use an rm125 air boot or that this was probably what i needed i jumped onto facebook marketplace because of that back order i started looking for things that were used things that might be local i ended up finding one just about 30 minutes north of me it was for a 2003 rm125 it had the diamonds in the side i thought i was onto something and i kind of was but this ended up not being the ticket although it did confirm that this now has the air boot way up high at the right place which is much higher than the 250 boot with the grids on the side and so this was a great affirmation that i was on the right track with the rm125 air boot so this 03 air boot has the nomenclature 36 f1 or the part number stamped right into the side of it you guys do not want to use that part number 36 f1 no good. The best thing about this was it only cost me a couple bucks. It arrived at my house in one day and it affirmed the height. But we're going to rip it out. The one I think you guys are going to need that I've seen in some AF builds online is 36F3. Very important. That is for the last generation, like 2006 through 2008 RM125. So this is going to be what I think you need. I haven't tried it yet. I don't do that stuff without you guys because I want you to learn as I learn. And if you're watching this video and you already knew this, why the hell didn't you tell me? At any rate, back to the older RM125 air boot and why you don't want to use it. Reason number one, I'm thinking that it is shorter overall, front to back. I could not get this thing plugged into the carburetor with the carburetor already in the bike. I had to actually clamp the older air boot to the carburetor first and then slide everything in as an assembly. And at this point, I was just trying to see if this thing would be high enough for the RMZ air box. But in doing that, having to clamp the old boot to the carb first to then weasel it in past the shock and into the engine. And I also had to keep pressure on it while I set the front carburetor band clamp to hold it all together. There's just too much rub on the shock. That old school RM125 air boot is just wrapped around the shock. It's touching it all the way. So it's no good. You would just have 
a hole eaten through that thing in a matter of minutes probably. Reason number two why you do not want to use the older air boot from the older 125 is that it had a different filter shape. So this new air boot has the same air filter shape as the RM250, which is great. First off, that means they're gonna make that style longer. Second, I already have seven or eight of those for my RM250s. And then lastly, you guys see this ring here with all these mounting holes. This is how we're going to be able to clamp the air boot to the RMZ air box, much in the same way it's clamped to the two-stroke models, but the old air boot, it is more like a YZ250 style or KTM style where there are two lips here on the edge and it weasels into the rim of the air box and doesn't have a clamp at all. I now have two of these newer style air boots. I ordered two from two different sources because as mentioned, I wasn't even sure if they're gonna show up at all. And so I started out by hitting my go-to OEM parts outlet, which is usually Rocky Mountain. I usually have stuff from them really quickly, as do most of you. But in my worry and my backup order, I remembered somebody on Facebook told me about a place called CMS. They're in Europe. And what's interesting is during my little freak out and secondary order, I placed it probably more than a week after the Rocky Mountain one and the CMS one still got here first. So pretty cool. Ordered the CMS one later, got it sooner. I want to say it was a little bit cheaper as well, which is unusual because Rocky Mountain, as you know, cheapest in town, but I wanted to commend CMS on that. I thought that was amazing, especially considering it's in a different country. So anyways, let's see if this newer style RM125 air boot slides in there like we hope it does and probably will. Let's get to work. Guys, maybe some good news. I can already see this newer style RM125 air boot is longer where it mounts to the carburetor. You can probably see that as well. For whatever it's worth, the RM250 clamp works just fine on this, even though it's an RM125 air boot. Oh, much better already. Just went in so much easier. I am connected to the carb and it's not touching the shock or the frame anywhere at all. It goes perfectly right on through. Now we wanna see if it's high enough. Yeah, guys, that's awesome. This thing is in there super naturally, like the bend and the arc of it going around the shock. It doesn't touch the shock at all so far. It doesn't touch the frame at all. It lends itself very well to the natural position of the RMZ's airbox opening. And so next I'm gonna, of course, have to figure out how to get that thing grafted to the RMZ airbox. And so this clamp and another clamp actually sandwich the boot to the airbox plastic. And then Suzuki uses this little foam gasket that goes in here. This is actually, the same style, they're still doing it on the RMZ. So not much has changed, just the shape. Something else that's really great is that as mentioned in previous episodes, the RMZ mounts the ECU up in the top of the frame cradle here. It's up above the air boot. And I really love that because it hides the ECU protects the wiring and means I only have to send one wire out to the handlebars to the kill switch. And so there isn't clutter. There aren't extra wires going up and out all over the frame. With this air boot, I'm able to keep that ECU in the exact same location. The air boot's now taller, which we needed and in the right place, but it isn't so high or too close to the ECU that would make me need to move it back out to the front behind the number plate, like the two stroke. And another thing I like about that is that the RMZ has these two holes on either side for the head stays. I'll be able to reuse these. It won't just be two holes hanging out in the open or cut off to make it look cleaner. I'm trying to mod this frame as little as possible. And even though this head stay will probably be somewhat difficult to make due to the angles it needs to go through to get to the back of the RM250 cylinder, I think it'll still be cooler to use these. And when you are as slow as I am, looking cool is really all that matters. And this is really great, guys. We are really close to being on target with this new air boot. You can see it almost falls right into where the old air box clamp went, although it's a completely different bolt pattern. We're just in the right neighborhood. When I tried to use the 250 air boot, it actually hung down here into this area where the four stroke exhaust would normally go. And so I would have had to trim that off if I even got it to graft in the first place. Now we don't need to worry about it. And this looks so much better. All right, guys, so that is killer news about the air boot. I'm pumped on that. It's time to get into those radiators. Now, these are definitely going to require modification. The RMZ radiators actually have a few less outlets or spigots on them than the RM250. And because when I bought all these RMZ 250 chassis parts, I also picked up the radiators for that frame, I still have my 2018 RMZ 450 radiators as well. So I'm going to show you some of the different clearances between the 450, particularly on the left side, because you could actually, to me, looks like you could run either or. So we'll jump into that and then we will put the two stroke radiators side by side with the four stroke radiators and see how they need to be altered in order to run this setup. Okay guys, so right now we are on the non-fill side of the chassis. This radiator pretty much goes right where you'd like it to, except we get 
some contact down here. This spigot sort of hits the power valve. And this is the 250 radiator. These are the radiators that actually were on this chassis right out of the factory. But something interesting happens when you take the 450 radiator and throw it on the 250 chassis. They're essentially the same, except the tank on the 450 is a little bit deeper. And so down in this area here, the spigot is actually low enough to go underneath the power valve when all the bolt holes are lined up. What I am noticing though for the first time, is that the bottom of this tank is hitting the frame. So you know what? I think the 450 radiator is out. So that actually settles that. I was pretty sure I was gonna be able to use the 450 radiator earlier because it was lower. I figured as much weight as this bike's already losing, why not go with the radiator that's just a little bit longer, clears the power valve better, and then has a little bit extra fluid capacity. But I didn't notice it hitting the frame last time I mocked it up. So 450 radiator is out. On the non-fill side, that settles it. We gotta use the RMZ 250 radiator. Let's go check out the other side. Now on this side, both the 250 and the 450 radiators are actually exactly the same. One nice thing about the fill side is that we don't have any contact points where the radiator is actually hitting anything. It bolts right up, everything looks good. But the main problem on this side is that this radiator is actually missing a spigot. And the other side is too, we're gonna take this to the bench and I'm gonna show you which spigots we're missing, which spigots we're probably going to need to add. And I'll be able to show that to you guys by pairing them up against the original RM250 radiator. So let's check that out. All right guys, so over here we have the original RM250 radiators. And as you can see, there are ports that cross over from one another, both top and bottom, as well as the spigot on the top that leads down to the cylinder head. And then the last port goes down to the water pump on the engine itself. So on the four stroke radiators, we're actually missing some spigots. We have the one that goes down to the cylinder head itself on the engine, no big deal. We have the crossover left and right on top, and then we have the port that would probably go down to the water pump on the engine. So the four stroke setup is missing a crossover from one to the other. Additionally, we have the non-fill side hitting the engine when this is mocked up on the frame. So what's probably gonna need to happen are these lower tanks are gonna need to get modified. I don't know if these are going to be extended left to right, but this is certainly going to be moved and when that happens, I would believe that the tank does need to be extended so it can be moved over. And then also it's going to need to be turned probably at a 90. Essentially what would happen is this spigot will link up to this spigot and then to get down to the engine, to the water pump, I think another spigot will need to be added. So having said that, my next step is going to be to send these suckers down to Brett at ICW Radiator. He is an aluminum welding wizard. He does amazing radiator repair, gusseting, whatever you might need. And I know he's done some of these AF conversions before. At any rate, that's my next step with the radiators and we'll get something cooked up that will bolt right onto this RMZ without any contact points and feeds all the proper locations on the engine and from radiator to radiator. All right, boys and girls, our last item on today's list is going to be how to get this electric fuel pump removed, blocked off, and then tapped for a petcock, the one that would feed a carburetor normally. And so we've got this Pentagon shaped deal here. This is what it looks like when the fuel pump is removed. And so we're also going to go ahead and remove this fuel pump here. You guys can see I bought a bunch of extra spare parts before I parted out my RMZ 450. Oh, it's a big boy. I didn't realize these things went that deep. So pretty much what we're gonna need to do is try and use this gasket on whatever block off plate we make. And of course, whatever block off plate we make will probably be just like this, same shape. I'll probably send this to Josh at 3DP Moto, get him to 3D print one up. It will lack this lower area and it will still accept this gasket. So it'll be probably raised cast inside just a little bit. So when Josh comes back with that, uh, we'll be able to get something, you know, put into production out of metal probably. And then the other thing Josh is going to have to do if this is flat is I'm going to send him a petcock as well. The one I want to use from the RM250 fuel tank, the regular on off style fuel valve. And then he'll be able to measure that and have this bottom plate tap or such a thing. And so this gasket just sits right in there, right in that little lip. Keep all the fuel from coming out. Now there might be another way to do this as well. My buddy Clint Lund is building a RMZ 250 with a YZ 250 power plant in it. I'll link that down below. Pretty cool, it's the last generation RMZ frame. And of course that had an electric fuel pump too. I think that he said he gutted this thing and then just let this spigot that's already here flow fuel through. So right now, can't blow through it, so I think he must have taken this apart and there's screws in it, so we should go ahead and see if that's something you guys could do as well. That would certainly save me the trouble of having a block off plate built. I'm sure this is serviceable and if your fuel pump goes out, this is how you'd probably do it. 
Yep, you could totally just run this same plate. I don't think I even need to make a block off plate for this at all. So I'll let you guys know what I end up doing, but pretty much, I mean, right there, that's a wrap. Let me see what happens if I pull the connectors out of this uh, and if we get any fuel that might flow through or if this can be decoupled uh, without any sort of incident. Got some wires up top. Looks like that one pulled out no problem. This other one looks like it might have like a plastic retainer on it so that it can't come out. No, it comes out too. <laughs> so yeah, guys, looks like these are just little blade terminals, female, and there are male ones inside the connector inside. And that's it. We could probably just use this, no problem. Now, the only issue we may have with this is that this might be too close to the spark plug. So I'll go ahead and put this thing back in the tank. We'll check that out real quick and decide whether or not we can just use this and be done or if we need to go ahead and build a block off plate. Guys, there's also some rubber bumpers in here. When the fuel pump sits in here, it rests on these probably so there isn't as much shock on the unit being a solid connection. I already took one of them out, but they're just sitting on some posts and they come right out. So if you do this or this works out, you wouldn't want to leave those in there and then have one of them jam up in this here fuel outlet and then, uh, you know, you stall it over a big triple. That would suck. All right, so we got our gasket. You probably want to grease that thing. Got this bad boy. Get that in there temporarily. Right now, we've got copious amounts of room for our spark plug and spark plug wire. See what happens when we drop the tank in. Absolutely nothing, still tons of room. <laughs> there you have it guys, I can slide my entire hand between the two. Tank is all the way in, no problem. I'd say right when it hits the digit where my finger hits my hand is where it starts to get tight. So yeah, five eighths of an inch maybe of a gap still. So you could definitely do it this way if you like. You just have to find a place to tie this bad boy up and then you also just kind of need to be okay with it being sort of halfway done, I guess. So guys, that's pretty cool. There's just one more way to do it. The only thing you gotta worry about are these wires and this just bothers me. There's not anything really wrong with it. And if I were to remove these and the connector they go to, I would have yet another open hole in this thing which i guess you could have welded at any rate just another way to do things there is clearance for it i'm glad lund and i talked about this that's what he's doing and his fuel pump might be a little bit different where he actually has less stuff regardless if we end up going this route or having a plate made which i probably will still do because i'd like to go through the experience of it we have two locations thereafter to put the fuel valve or the petcock we can put it right here in the bottom of this which probably would cause some clearance issues with the spark plug or we can do like the 05 06 07 rmz 450 and some of the crfs of that era they just had a 90 degree elbow coming out of the bottom of the tank which led to a hose and then like this intermediate fuel valve that was bolted on to one one of the frame spars behind the radiator shroud and then carried onto the carburetor. That would be super clean and it would also get the fuel valve out to a way more accessible location than way under the center of the tank. At any rate, you guys know I'm gonna let you know what I do. And so before we sign off today, guys, I just wanna say thank you so much for watching. I also wanna remind you about the YZ250 build and giveaway. Project Thundercracker is rolling. You've got just a few weeks left. I've given away a metric shit ton of dirt bike parts already. I'm giving away dirt bike parts in every build series episode. Those are literally just to thank you to keep the contest super fun and exciting. Coming up, I have Fathead Cylinder Heads, Electron Carburetors, $100 No Toil gift cards, Decal Works, Complete Graphics Kits, some Bolt Motorcycle Hardware Pro Packs, some Handlebars. I got a ton of stuff to give away. And so when you enter to win the bike, you're automatically entered to win all that stuff. And if you win any of those items, you can still win the bike. Also, you can win items again and again. I've already had three guys win twice. I'm not that big of a deal yet, guys, so your odds are pretty good. Just another reason to join while I'm still a little guy. Wait, a little guy? That doesn't seem right. Well, I'm still a, a little guy, you know, a little guy. Anyways, I'm gonna make it easy on you guys. Go ahead, please smash this link right here. Get entered. You're gonna be helping me help Road to Recovery and Cameron Nimala in his battle with cancer. As always, I appreciate you. I'll check in soon with more progress. And until then, shred safe, and I'll see you soon.